All right, so what I brought was just emergency preparedness due to all our weather situations that we're having and today's events. Just to briefly give you a guide on what to do in situations where there's hazardous situations due to weather or natural disasters or man-made disasters. And then after I go through this briefly, I want to touch on our search and rescue division and what we're doing currently with training and how we involved and hopefully maybe get some of y'all involved in our search and rescue. So disasters can happen anytime, anywhere. Um, we had the hurricanes in Florida, the flooding in Texas, the wildfires in California, and many of you are aware of all our um, civil dis disturbances going on in the city of Charlottesville from July to August to still currently today that we're dealing with every day, every minute. So as all y'all know, there's weather situations from rain to snow to freezing, the winter stuff. Everybody knows that when Henry Graff says there's a storm coming in and 29 years, people go flood the grocery stores and buy loaves of bread, and that's all they care about. They have to get to the store no matter the road conditions. And when we say stay off the roads, what do they do? They gotta go to the store to buy that bread and that milk. Do we advise that? No, we do not because the hazards, you got trees down, power lines down, um, people can't drive in the snow. I'm one of them, it terrifies me to death. Not because of my ability, but because of other people's ability. So when they scare me, I get scared and I'm like, I don't wanna be out there. Somebody else come get me because it stresses me out to no end. Um, has anybody been stranded in a storm before on the roads? Do any of y'all go out um, to assist during weather situations other than radio stuff to pull people out, stuff like that? So y'all also need to be prepared yourselves. So summer weather, thunderstorms, um, lightning, hurricanes. We were fortunate enough that we didn't get everything from Irma that we were supposed to get. Extreme heat, flooding fires. So does anybody have an emergency kit in their vehicle? One, two, three, four. What's in your kits? Uh, we go over to West Virginia a lot in the winter, so I've got a lot of cold weather and survival stuff, blankets and flares. <clears throat> um, in the winter I take uh, some sand or salt, uh, snow shovel. Okay. How many in this room have cell phones? Just about everybody? Do you prepare in case your cell phone doesn't go? Battery dies, then what? Radios. 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 Okay. Does, do you have a time where the radios don't work? Generator. Generator. Do you have a generator in your vehicle? Not your house, but your vehicle. There you go. Um, do you have a plan for your family to what to do in extreme weather situations? You know, not your concern, but their concern of a plan for them to what you can expect, phone numbers, who to call, who to contact. Does anybody have any family in Florida or Texas? Were you able to contact them or were they able to contact you? Um, there's the emergency kit. Medication. How many people in here are on medication? <laughs> How many people are not on medication? <laughs> so before we have any severe weather, do y'all plan on having your medication filled to have enough to get through like a natural disaster or a tremendous snowstorm? You don't realize how many phone calls we get saying it's two days into a snowstorm, I don't have my medicine. Now we're volunteers or driving people to the store or going to the pharmacy picking up medication to get back to people that didn't plan at all for a major storm.
So emergency kits for home, for work, for cars. Any of y'all have pets? What are you doing with your pets? You got to make sure they're taken care of. Your kids, your grandkids, your spouses, to make sure they have everything that they're going to need what to wear um, in a storm. Everybody tells you layers, layers, layers. Um, windshield scrapers. My favorite thing for a windshield scraper is a credit card. They work wonders. They can scrape windshields and they can get you inside buildings, especially your house. So if you ever wonder if your house is credit card proof to break a lot, try it. My Costco card works excellent. <laughs> It does, seriously. Um, summer weather. Does the situations change from summer to, to winter? Basically, no. You're just dealing with different environments. Um, layering clothes is not as important in the summertime. Do you need all the same things? You really don't need emergency blankets as much to keep warm in the summertime. Um, this is family planning, what you need. If your cell phones die, do you know contact numbers? Do you know your phone number for home? Do you know your wife's cell phone number? Do you know numbers to contact people? Because thanks to te technology today, everything's in this great device, but nobody remembers phone numbers. They think they can go to their cell phone and pull the number up. And you'll be surprised at the population today that can't, there's somebody banging at the door, that can't remember a simple phone number. I done skipped over that too. Is anybody in here still working? <laughs> <laughs> that's not retired? That's not living the life of retirement? It's having a full time Monday through Friday job? Do y'all have plans at work? What to do in emergencies? What to do if a tornado hits the building? No. Is it important that you have a plan? Probably so. Yeah. So what will you be doing tomorrow? Be making a plan. <laughs> there you go. So have exits. What exit do you go to? Do you have a rally point for everybody to respond to that location and make sure they're out of the building safe, that everybody's together, everybody's accounted for? Um, practice. You practice your drills to make sure everybody knows the route and how to get there, and an alternative route if that route is blocked. Now, where do we go? What do we do? Stay informed, uh, right? Mm -hmm. How do y'all stay informed? Radios. It's the same thing. Our radio system um, here, ECC, has been gracious enough to have the system called Code Red. It alerts citizens in a particular community of what's going on in their area, um, whether there's a lost person, whether there's a Project Lifesaver, whether there's a missing person, whether something's going on with the police department and you need to stay inside. So that's an easy thing. You can go on to Code Red and sign up for emergency alerts, whether it's weather related, to know that something's coming in your area. You will get text messages or emails saying this is going on, be prepared. Um, that's something that is pretty good. Is that like a reverse 911 thing? Um, Sometimes we get a call. It yeah. is, but it also, there's different areas to it right. that you can be, of what you choose to be notified for. Um, one is everything where you get missing persons, you get weather, you get serious events, and there's other, you can choose of what you get contacted, and it's all based on cold red and, and the reverse stuff. Because we send out stuff all the time through ECC of what's going on. Like I got it on my phone when I get any time there's a thunderstorm, my phone goes off and tells me there's a thunderstorm going on at 411 East High Street. I should probably really change it to my house and let me know what's going on there. But I don't work so much, I figured I'd just put that address in. Um, disasters. Power and telephone systems may be lost out, especially if you live in the Earlsville area. That's the first section of the county that goes often and quickly. Backup generators, whether you have them. If you don't, it's probably a good idea that you do. Um, who to call? 
Who knows the non-emergency phone number to ECC? No, no. 979 info? 9779041. Correct. So if you dial 911 and you can't get through, what number do you dial? That number that he just gave you, is that a good number to have? Probably program in your phone? Absolutely. You want to tell them what it is again? 977-9041. Yep. And that is the non-emergency number to the Emergency Communications Center. Um, a big event going on in the world today, active shooter. For those of you that are having the privilege of going to work Monday through Friday every day, do you have an active shooter? Have you been trained in active shooter? Do you know what to do for an active shooter? So what will you be doing again tomorrow? More research. <laughs> <laughs> so right now the big thing is um, run, hide, and fight with active shooter. It used to be stay and put, and you would have people, we would actually tell people to hide under the desk, but not anymore. It's run, hide, and fight. How many of you have concealed weapons permits? All right. Get involved. How many of you are CERT members? I know I got one back there. Two. So this is the biggest thing for citizens that we push out there. Um, if they're not joining our search and rescue, it's we want people involved. CERT does a tremendous job in our community from um, coming out, working events with us, showing up on search and rescue members' um, missions. They're just a great tool that we can never replace with, with paid staff. So thank you, our CERT members. <clears throat> questions about that before I touch on our search and rescue stuff? No questions. All right, so search and rescue, in case most of y'all don't know, um, we have a 100-person all-volunteer search and rescue. And we've been involved in, I don't know how many searches over the last five years. Um, Morgan Harrington is the big one that started the national attention to our search and rescue. Um, Hannah Graham. Um, we have a couple other ones, Elvis Shiflett. And so um, right now we're currently developing um, plans for our unmanned aerial systems. Right now we got three USAs that people train to actually deploy in search and rescue missions where they go out and we actually got permission to fly at night now. Um, where we go out, we send a UAS or otherwise known as a drone up in the air. They get really mad when you say drone. Um, and actually got permission to go search and use that for search and rescue missions. So um, we're thrilled with that because it saves so much time and Is energy. For infrared or what's it, how's it set up? Yeah. Um, just visual only. visual only for right now. We um, are looking at, we got flare systems that we got for our vehicles and stuff, um, our UTV to put on there. But right now, they haven't developed anything small enough for us to put on our UASs to um, go search for somebody right now. Um, we got a helicopter that we can put a flare on. Um, well, we used to have a helicopter. We don't have that anymore. But we're thinking about contracting with a company in Richmond that will actually have a flare on a helicopter. So now, what's all this have to do with y'all? So what's the biggest part of any search and rescue mission? Communication, right? So right now, all our communications come out of Richmond um, when they bring their vehicles. When we call VDEM in, they bring all their radio systems in. So um, my question's for y'all, since I'm at the experts here. Do y'all see a ro role for y'all in our search and rescue? Me too. There's got to be areas where the coverage either by cell or your radio systems may not. Oh, yeah, cover. these things? Yeah. yeah. I live in Scottsville. I can't talk downtown Scottsville to uptown Scottsville. <laughs> and if you've ever been to Scottsville, that's not far. It's like a quarter of a mile. 
Um, so, yeah, so basically I was excited to come here today to see if I can get y'all involved in our search and rescue. We've got repeaters and folks, everyone, everyone here has radios. One of our members, I think, is involved, Mark Orlinski, I'm sure you know. He is. He's our, uh, one of our sergeants in our reserve division. Yeah, Where is he tonight? He's a member? Yes. And he's not here? He doesn't, he doesn't come to that. Mark what is, uh, is involved in some of the search and rescue? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sarah Bogley should be on your team as well. She is. Um, and she has just now stepped up and actually participating in a lot of UAS's training and um, actually did training on her first um, mission where she was actually using the remote control to actually fly the UASs. So See, I have to think about it before I say it. If we're interested, contact you. Perhaps. Contact me, yes, and I will put you in charge. Um, Tom Payne is a lieutenant in charge of our search and rescue, um, and he keeps track of all the um, hundred members that we have because you have to fill out an application and we run your criminal history. Um, and then we send you to training, and they What's have. What's the training involved? It depends on how involved you want to get. Um, for search and rescue, it starts up with being a, a team member, then it goes up to be a field team member where you're actually in charge of a team searching. Um, but I need to figure out, you really wouldn't be on a team if you're using the ham radios. I wouldn't think. Well, it depends. Well, yeah. It would be good to have somebody, at least one person on each team. That's true. Kind of like they embed when they go to some kind of conflict, you know, they embed the reporters, they embed someone with a ham radio yeah. who can then talk back to the others who are stationary. Yeah. yeah. Certainly have a net control, have it at a base station, if you will. Right. right. Exactly. So then it becomes just um, the first level of training, which is you follow, you're not a leader. You're, at that point, you're just a follower and doing whatever in there to be the communications person to call back to, um, as long as we have somebody in the command post to call back to as base, then I think we're good. So. Yeah. Yeah, when, um, I currently live in Texas, and I was, I was there when the, uh, the shuttle exploded. Mm -hmm. And one of the big communications problems they had, that they had to rely on the hands for was we have five districts of state police. None of them can inter communicate with the radios. So the hands were the ones that, so they're out there, they were out there with each of the major units. Yeah, and that's the, that's the biggest thing we have now with the state police. We can't communicate with them. Really? Yeah, because their radio system's two totally different systems. and. And we have to get, actually physically give them one of our radios because we can't. Um, can't change to a different channel. And be on the no, channel. and sometimes they have to patch them through, but that takes a lot of time and effort. So we're like, here you go, use one of ours. Mm -hmm. But when it gets a situation, then radios get sparse, especially for battery life. Oh, okay. Do you use like our trunking systems? Like yes. Trunking? Yep. You're very smart. <laughs> Y'all need to keep him around for a long time. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? I know that was short and sweet. But... Yes. Do they, I don't hear anything about dogs in this. I understand that's pretty big. The dogs in search and rescue? Yeah. Yes, we've actually used to have two dogs, but they are not searching anymore. And we rely on Richmond for VDEM to, we call them at, during search and rescue members, and they say, what you need? And we say, send us everything. So they send dogs. They also have mounted patrol where they send horses out um, and search members and um, search team leaders that have experience of actually running search and rescue members for a long duration of time as opposed to us who were basically a hasty team. We go respond, we show up, we do our immediate search, and if after a day or so we can't find the person, we call in the big guys, you know, and they come all over the region to come help us 
and set up stuff and there's a tremendous amount of personnel that they bring with us with them to help us search for people how many cases do you get a year from missing persons is it a lot um it depends usually we go like this um when we had morgan harrington and then we dipped back up to hannah graham um and then had a couple more searches in there we average about three a year um we had one two months ago a gentleman went missing um behind the fashion square mall um and actually reverse 911 um saved us they saw him at cvs and we called well the caller called in and said he was he wearing a, a green hat and we're like i don't know was he Send an officer to his house, ask his wife, and she goes, I don't know if he was or not. He has one. <laughs> <laughs> and so then we started tracking him down and ended up finding him a half a mile from the CVS on 29, and he was actually walking down 29. So. So, um, so in a, a search and rescue situation, all of your resources mobilized. The, the radio cache that the 911 center has, is that adequate to supply all the people that you put out in the field for a search? ECC does a good job of sending us cash radios when we request it. We get boxes of them, even for football games, we use them. Um, and usually there's five to a box. So last time we got two boxes. Um, I wasn't involved. I just recently became involved in search and rescue in the last year and a half. And fortunately, knock on wood, we haven't had a major call out. But there's places in Albemarle County that we can't talk on them. And so then we rely on our phones can't get out. So now we have no radio communication and no phone communication. So we just do one of these, you know, and try to wait until we get signal. So you get your guys uh, to become hands, and then they would have access to all the repeaters and so forth. But they would still have to be search and rescue members. Well, yeah. See my point? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I guess my, my question is, are there any sort of physical requirements for search and rescue members? Do you have to be able to hike certain distances up certain hills or, you know, just, just what sort of, just how rugged and ready do you have to be? You have to be mobile. Um, with this shiftlet search, we were searching banks um, to the river because we know he supposedly went in the river and we were searching inclines. I actually lost my cell phone on that search. Um, a tree, if I started sliding down the hill, I grabbed onto the tree to save me from falling and it was a dead tree, so I went like this. <laughs> and then I get back up and going, where's my cell phone? <laughs> oh well, another thing lost. Anybody else got a question? Yes. Uh, it's not a question, but a comment. A, uh, uh, a female broadcast went out to all the hands in this area from the national headquarters, uh, from the state emergency coordinator, saying that at the time of the hurricane hit Puerto Rico, the first thing American Red Cross did was to contact the national headquarters of Connecticut, and they mobilized people from all over, because the motto of ham radio is when all else fails. When the cell tower's out, ham radio is always there. There you go. Good motto. Yes. Uh, how many watts does your hand have? I don't know. That's a good question. It's out about five. Does it? The last time I looked at the Motorola specification, it was about five watts. And my, I was going to ask, has there been any discussion in the sheriff's office about uh, the fact that the city and the county just signed a new contract with Harris Corporation to do a new system to talk about those coverage gaps that you were talking about? Yes, I just found out um, 
actually last week that <laughs> these are soon to be history yeah. and we just bought these like <laughs> last year wow. when they said we need to update your radios and I'm like cool I get a new radio to compact radio and now I learned last yeah, week yeah. that this is going to be obsolete yeah, yeah. So you, in our radios, we pair in with Almar County PD, so whatever Almar PD does, we do. They are gracious enough to put us in that contract because it boosts their numbers and we get a better price. So, yes, sir. Ken, uh, I'm confused about the fact that, uh, say, the state police and sheriff's department and others can't communicate with each other. What prevents that? Uh, what's the issue? The radio system. Well, yes, but uh, what philosophy, what, uh, is it money, is it uh, um, certain? The state uh, police is on an ancient radio <laughs> system. They never upgrade it because, I mean, have you ever heard of SIRS? Back the way they used to communicate, SIRS radio. Um, and now we finally got away from that. It was very cool but we could talk to each other and talk to the state police. But now they're a radio system and they haven't upgraded. And we changed, um, we went to 800 megahertz about seven, eight years ago. And the state police is still, they're not doing anything. And their radios are bricks, man, they're about that big. And it would cost so much for them to upgrade their whole complete system across the state that they just continue to use and this. there's not a lobby system that helped for, to promote your uh, the integration of that, I'm sure, in the, in the, uh, the House of Delegates and the Senate and the state, of course. Not that I'm aware of, <laughs> no. It's just easier for us to give our troopers our radios to say, here, use them. Yeah. It's, not, it's not so simple as just buying radios. No. Yeah. Okay. It's the so whole infrastructure and same. towers so, and... Uh, Starts Repeaters. First, well, it starts first with a frequency. Yeah. You got to have the frequency. And one of the things that drove the local jurisdiction into the trunking system in the first place was that there was there was a window, and, and basically the, the the proposition was it's available, it's available for this length of time. If you don't take it during that window, you lose it. Okay. And so. That's, that, that's what, that was the initial driving force behind the, the, the switch to the, to the, to the uh, at, at that time, 700 megahertz trunking. But, so you got to have, you got to have, you got to, you got to get the license, basically. So it's no different from us in, in, in looking for a frequency pair for repeaters, you know, mm -hmm. it's got to be available and then you right. have to get it. I was yes. uh, going to ask uh, a little bit about uh, how closely do you sort of coordinate with the uh, local emergency manager and that sort of thing, because uh, the amateur radio emergency services group or ARIES mm -hmm. typically does our coordination through them. So if you did have a need for people, for ham radio operators to go out with search teams, uh, routing something through Allison would be a good way to, to do that. Okay. But I've just mentioned. Yeah, I work with Allison um, frequently doing other stuff. So that's that boosts my numbers for search and rescue, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't understand your hang up. Why couldn't through Allison you get some ham operators detailed to you without saying they have to be members of search and rescue? Is there anything in your bylaws that really mandate that? No, not really. It's just. Yeah, I come out to it. She has a, a, a objective to recruit a certain number of people into search and rescue. <laughs> I think that's so. So poking <laughs> through uh, the, the county does not meet that objective for them. So is your objective to boost membership and you want to get? No, my objective is to, when I have a search and rescue member, to find the person as quickly as possible. Um, so more, having so, more people to use would be Having some of them trained in ham radio, that would be awesome, you're saying? Yes, 
to actually be a part of, to know what it is to go out and search for somebody, to have that experience, um, to know what's going on, to know when we say north, well, you know, there is north, and by getting, as I had one person say, I know where north is. It's right here. Well, if I turn here, is it still there? What if I turn here? Yes, we do um, yearly search and rescue um, training. They do um, map reading as a big part of it. That if you don't know where true north is, we have a problem. Um, so they do, we have a, a two-day training exercise usually in the spring where we bring everybody in and we actually stage areas and they actually go out and they have to do the map reading, plan a course, and the team leader goes and does everything just like a search. Okay. So. You know, if you're going to have your search people trained, we're starting classes in January. <laughs> so it'll be easier for me to send search and rescue members to be ham trained. We can work both ways, I agree. I can see both bodies. Good idea. You know, if, if Mark, ham, right? So he's my end. Yeah, if a ham radio person is attached to you as a communicator, they don't have to be a search and rescue person, they're a communicator. She's saying, in an ideal world, it'd be good to have the person. Right. And, yeah. What I'm, what I'm saying is, you get into you get into black holes and you can't talk to anybody. So if there's a communicator with you that can establish contact with the ECC or whatever, that's what you want. You want to be able to communicate. True. Well, I also think there's got to be some kind of. I mean, I'm sure there's a set of jargon that goes along with everything you do there is. and that having the training for that so you know what they're talking about when they give yeah. you a particular command. I've got a 1036 or something. Right. So my, you know point what is, she's saying. my point is, would you rather sit in black hole or would you rather have a communicator with you who doesn't do their training? Mm -hmm. yeah. you, uh, <laughs> I, I think we have the potential for an extended uh, conversation. <laughs> we do not. Who do we contact? Who do we contact? You and, and Lieutenant, uh, what's, what's the name? Tom Payne. Tom Payne. Yes. I, you know, many of us in this room have participated in public service events where our own personal cell phones wouldn't get through. There were police officers from out in Warwick County who walked in and said, could you call so-and-so? So our VHF repeater system within Albemarle County and surrounding counties has excellent coverage, even in what might be holes to your radio system. Except for Radio Free Howardsville. And lucky for us, we haven't had anybody go missing yeah. in Howardsville. <laughs> that would be great. I just need to figure out what's best for both parties and, and how to make it work. Because you said some of your people to the training person, January. And we'll send some people to your class. There you go. Sounds like a compromise. <laughs> Question for you. Sure. Uh, for somebody like me that is violently allergic to poison ivy and poison oak um, and would like to become a member with the search and rescue, is that a possibility or is that generally sorry but no? Do you have limitations based on your severe allergicness? Like, can you go in the woods? <laughs> Not very far. I have to be very, very careful. I'm, I mean, it's all I have to do is seemingly look at it and I get it. Yeah, me too. So, and then I break out from head to toe. Much, yeah. yeah. And then that pink lotion. Yeah, yeah I look like so it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, yes, there's other stuff you could do. Okay. Like we actually have somebody that we put in a command post in charge of communications that they do nothing but track and monitor the radio. So yes, there's other stuff that you could actually do other than going trekking through the woods or wherever. I mean, here lately we've been um, 
on sidewalks, roadways, looking up, looking for the buzzards where they are. I mean, it's absolutely crazy, but we do it every day. Luckily, not every day, but anytime we're needed, we map it out and look for God's clues too, like the buzzards fly. And hopefully it's not hunting season. Um, would you have a need for volunteers to fly your drones? Um, right now we have three people, but they have to be trained. And right now they have to be um, pilots or have a waiver from the FAA to fly them. Well, I used to fly planes, but uh, I've never tried to drown. But I think I know some, some young men who have probably forgotten more about flying drones than you would ever learn. <laughs> Yeah, um, we can put them in touch with um, Tom Payne and see if they're taking on more people okay. to to train. Because I know right now we have we have three four four operators that can actually yeah. operate them, and then they have to have a wingman to actually track and be visual and keep records of distance and stuff. Can we get a copy of your PowerPoint briefing? Sure. So we can post it on our website. It's easier to grasp your contact information than watching the video. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, search and rescue cross jurisdictional lines. Is that just the coordination between search and rescues and county A and county B? Or is there some No, we go through VDEM. Um, so, so yeah, and each area has their own search. I mean, we have ours specifically for Albemarle County, and there's different areas. We got Piedmont region that covers, uh, I think, Southwest Virginia, and then we got a Northern Virginia team that covers that area of Northern Virginia, and um, there's actually teams that cover several counties. Um, but when we put out a need for search and rescue to call VDEM, then people come wherever they come from. Just, I mean, they keep their packs loaded, their trucks and vehicles are packed with all their search and rescue gear, and they actually take off of work and drive hours. Um, if we call them out at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're responding at 2 o'clock. Because when we get to say, we need help, as soon as we put out that call, then it immediately goes out to anybody in that area and to all over the state and people show up ready to go to work. So, yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned the search and rescue and, and these packs. I'm just curious, what, how, how much material is needed to be able to put that package together? What kinds of things are, are in, involved in that? Um, flashlights, um, gear whether you need extra clothing, extra socks. You'd be amazed how many people have socks. Um, flag and tape, when you go by and you um, search a particular area, you flag where you search so we will know that um, that area has been searched. Um, water, um, power bars, anything that you're going to be out there for an extended period of time that you need to be able to continue moving about because they're out there for hours at a time. Emergency blankets, half of them have emergency blankets because if it's cold weather, then they have to be able to, all right, now what do I need to be able to keep this person um, warm until help arrives? So, anybody got any other questions? Any other questions before we wrap up? One last question. With sure. the unmanned aerial systems you were talking about before, is Charles Warner involved with that at all? Um, Charles Warner actually helped us get our program. He was one of the key people to um, get it off the ground and get it running, go through um, the FAA to um, work on our COA and get our agreement, get the county um, set up to where they can accept it. 
because we actually had to have people donate the UASs to the county of Albemarle because that's the only way the COLA would work. We actually had to give it to the county, and the county let us keep it to maintain it and, and test it. So they donated it, and then we got it back, and we keep it on the search and rescue trailer, and they take it out once a week and go fly it. It's really cool. I want that job, but they won't let me have it. <laughs> <laughs> there just went $5,000. <laughs> well, thank you all for having me here. contact if you would like to join search and rescue and then I will work on getting people to join here through mark so you might stick around, before we break